Talk to us a little bit about this 40,000 opus of an essay and really what the key takeaways were for you. So for me, it was kind of just an opportunity to have crypto demystified. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've spent the last you know, couple of years really getting deep into crypto. And every story I do, I'm asking the writer, wait, what is this thing? Mm -hmm. Is this a company? Is this a protocol? What's this thing that's happening on the blockchain? Crypto has a way of um, filling the space with new words and what seem like new ideas that you have to decode in order to even tell the simplest story about crypto. And one of the things that Matt really accomplished in this piece, and I think that everyone who reads it will enjoy this, is that it takes crypto step by step and explains it, and most importantly, doesn't do it with the purpose of selling you on crypto. Yeah. In fact, I think it's really a tool for thinking about it so that when you're encountering it and you're asking yourself, what is this thing that I'm looking at? What is this thing I'm being sold or pitched on? What is this thing I might be considering investing in? What is this thing my kid is talking to me about? Is this something that I, that I am familiar with as opposed to being intimidated into thinking that I couldn't understand it and it's so much more sophisticated than I could grasp? And well done, because the bit that irritates me so much is mm -hmm. the discussion about democratization, but it's very undemocratic to put up acronyms in areas that we don't understand and then make everyone feel that it's still a walled garden. But mm -hmm. where the addiction has been real, and I've seen it in my own family, is from traditional finance, or TradFi, they right. try and bemuse us with that turn of phrase, but traditional finance, they, if they catch the bug for crypto, yeah. they will go all in as well. Are we still hearing of that revolving door and whether that will continue? Well, I think some of that was happening, as Matt says, you know, the lines were going up for a yeah. while, and yeah. so uh, this was a place to go. Lately, the lines have been going down. Um, uh, not obviously in traditional finance and in crypto. So uh, that, may, that may slow things down, but one of the things that crypto does is it gives people like another door to go through. So sometimes maybe you are, I think we've seen this, you're, you're doing something in traditional finance and things aren't quite clicking for you or it's not moving as fast as you'd like. Yeah. Meanwhile, over here, there's this other new financial system that if you can master a piece of code, um, because it's all there and it's, and it's new to get built, you can, you can start moving right away. You know, those of us who've covered finance for a while knows that, know, know that there's cycles where that happens, where there's a new thing mm -hmm. on the ground. I mean, I, I started covering finance in the 90s. It, this sort of sounds unbelievable, but once mutual funds were the hot new thing, <laughs> that if you were young, so that you would, start, you would start in. Then it was ETFs. This is sort of a place where people can get in on the ground floor. Well, people started to get in. I think when crypto became something that many could understand or at least be tantalized by was NFTs. It was the right. idea that, oh, I can understand that a royalty is going to be going to an artist. People can own what they have made yeah. and keep sort of a value of that as it goes through different people's hands. Is NFT still a gateway to the system because they have so fallen out of love in terms of a valuation yeah. perspective? Where are we in crypto in the longer term? So, you know, uh, Matt, when he looks at the piece, kind of talks about sort of how thin the connection is between the code that you're uh, investing in on the blockchain and what the actual piece of art is. I do think that for a lot of people, um, you know, it's sort of disturbing to imagine that, like, well, Bitcoin, what's backing the value of a Bitcoin? I don't know. Um, now, there's nothing really backing the value of a board ape, but at least you could sort of say to yourself, it's like, well, I kind of understand the art market, so at least to the extent that it's a little bit arbitrary and aesthetic, I understand that there's a market like that. I think, uh, this is outside of the scope of Matt's story, but I think we've all observed that there were, there were, enough, there were enough shenanigans in that market, yep. in kind of creating inflated valuations, yep. um, that mistakes. I think that's given people a lot of pause about getting into that space. So what then, because we talk a lot across all of our platforms here, that yes, in some ways it's a store mm -hmm. of value still, it's generally a trading asset type. Yeah. When does it become more than that? When does it become integral to yours and my way of life? I mean, I, that's really the question that Matt's wrestling with. Matt, as you know, is really just an expert on finance. And what he really focuses on is the degree to which crypto finance is just finance. It's very similar to finance. When you strip it all down, even though it's a new thing and it gives people a new, faster start on certain things, it's often rebuilding the same structures yeah. that we've had before, maybe in new ways, often in disastrous ways. Inside of the crypto space, we didn't just see a crypto winner. We really saw a crypto 2008. They built all of the structures that created a financial crisis inside of crypto. Um, I think it's very interesting that that crisis didn't really leak out into the rest of the market. I think, however, that's probably one reason why crypto is continuing to be worth our attention is 
The people who are building these structures are building things that look a lot like the things in traditional finance that break and sometimes break disastrously.